Hello, gorgeous. Welcome to HG Radio, everything beauty, cancer, and inspiration. Here is your co-founder and host, Kim Becker. Hello, gorgeous, and thank you for joining us today. I'm your host, Kim Becker, and this is Hello, Gorgeous, everything beauty, cancer, and inspiration on Society Bites Radio, social interaction for the mind and soul. Our host, our guest today is Geraldine O'Brien. Geraldine is a licensed esthetician who specializes in oncology-focused skincare. Geraldine provides skincare consultation, facials, and spa days at Waterford Place Cancer Resource Center in Aurora, Illinois. In 2018, she helped to design and implement a pilot program called Simply Beautiful, which educates women in safe skincare and makeup while enhancing each woman's natural beauty. She is also an ambassador with Oncology Spa Solutions, where she helps bring oncology awareness to lo- local aesthetic schools and estheticians in Illinois and serves as a contributor to the Integrative Cancer Review Online Journal. Geraldine works to empower those impacted by cancer and continues to advocate on their behalf. She says that healing is a journey and she constantly sees the benefits that wellness program provide to cancer patients and their families. Hi, Geraldine, and welcome to the show. Hello. Hello, oh, Kim. Well, thank I'm, you for having me. Oh, um, I am I'm, so excited to have you here. I am so excited to be here, and I just love your uh, whole mission of Hello Gorgeous and your whole team. I hope to witness one of your makeovers one of these days. And, that would be wonderful. Um, your book, I just love your book. I think it's a great guide. When uh, I have, I only read the I Promise to Put My Lipstick On When I Get There. And um, I just think it's just such inspiring stories, you know, and tips for the cancer patients. Well, so thank I'm you. glad we can connect Me and too. empower each other. Me and too. And I admire your uh, dedication for continuing on even after losing your partner. So well, thank you. Your, a... your dream uh, continues to thrive. And I love that. Well, thank you. It was a promise that I made to him and I knew that that was the best way that I could honor him. um, Actually, Trisha, who you talked with on the phone, um, it was very cool. She she said, um, you know, there are so many people who say to us all the time, gosh, I wish I could have met him. I wish I could have met Michael. And I thought, you know, here it is. He's been gone like 26 months. And, you know, we've obviously done a really good job of carrying on his legacy when we still have people who are saying, hey, we really wish we would have, you know, we could have met him. So I think we're honoring right. him in, in just the right way. So well, um, what a I'm, way to keep it. Yeah. Yeah. Keep him alive, you know, well, you know, he loved Hello Gorgeous. So we will continue to do this in his honor. So so I want to know about you. So um, I understand that you have battled cancer three times. Three times, yes. How did that happen? Oh, <laughs> my thriving. goodness. Yeah, and you're still here I to tell. Still, so in, I inspire me. Tell me your story. Pushing. So in December of 1997, um, 42 years old, I was diagnosed with my first breast cancer. So I was already receiving mammograms because like two years before, I had had a benign cyst. Okay. So it was just about time for my mammogram. They were going to start doing them every two years. And, um, so I felt like this lump just all of a sudden appeared one day. I mean, it was like big, my skin was like rippling and I was like, oh my God, where'd this come from? I was in a lot of pain and, um, called the surgeon who did, um, remove the first, um, benign cyst. And he says, well, maybe it's another benign cyst. I'll get you in right away for a mammogram. And then he called immediately after the mammogram. He says, you know, I want to take this out. It's large. I don't like how it looks. And um, so, I mean, it all went like so fast. You know, Mm -hmm. here I am, 42. Um, He removed it, uh, the cyst. I mean, well, what I thought was a cyst. And about maybe a day or two later, he called me and he said, oh, I hate to do this to you over the phone. He said, but I'm leaving to go out of town. He said, and um, you do have cancer, you know, so it's like you hear those words at 42 and you're just like, oh, my God, now what do I do? Mm. Um, so after that initial shock, my husband happened to be home. He uh, was working like second shift. It was early afternoon. He called his friend who was an internist and whose wife had had breast cancer. And 
he directed us to one of the uh, universities in Chicago. And we got calls, got in there within a couple of days, went down there. And I really loved the whole team. They had me meet everybody. And they wanted me to get into a clinical trial mm. for um, the sentinel node biopsy. Mm -hmm. So then I had never heard of it. So you are probably familiar with that. With, yes. You know, it's now standard treatment. And so I went back then, uh, my appointment with the doctor who had removed the cyst, and I said, you know, I've decided to go with a clinical trial at one of the universities. And he, he looked at my husband and I, and he said, if you were my wife, I would do the exact same thing. Wow. And he said, that's actually where I've been. He said, I've been learning that procedure, and I think it's going to be a real changer in the breast cancer uh, diagnosis. And he just, we just had so many questions. He sat there and answered everything. You know, he was just so kind. And we walked out of his office and his whole waiting room was filled. So I always now, when I go to the doctor and it's taking so long, I always think about, gosh, even after I just told him I was leaving, you know, his whole hospital and everything, he still took the time to answer everything. So yes, that was that always, for you know. It makes a difference, yeah. doesn't it? When they take the time and they, they actually listen to yeah. what you're saying. Now, for the people that are listening, our, our um, listeners, explain what a sentinel node biopsy is. So the sentinel node surgery is a surgical procedure where they determine if the cancer like has spread beyond the primary tumor into your lymph system. Yes. So it's less invasive than they used to do. You know, they used to, uh, with breast cancer surgeries, remove maybe 15, 20 lymph nodes and a lot more invasive. So you're injected with a dye, and then the dye is supposed to spread to the nodes, um, just kind of how our lymph system drains and how the tumor would drain. So it's like the first lymph. So they only have to remove a few lymph nodes. And then if those were all cancerous, they would go back. You okay. know? So it's less Good. invasive. Yes. And now it's pretty much standard treatment. I mean, yes, that was 1998. I, well, and I know that so many times, too, um, that uh, a lot of times when they um, remove a lot of the lymph nodes, then women then struggle with their lymphedema afterwards, you know, in their yeah. arm and underneath. And, you know, that can be cumbersome. Mm -hmm. So you get through the cancer and then you have that. So yes, I wanted them oh, to understand yeah. that with the scent, it, it is less invasive. So that's wonderful. Yeah. So yeah. what kind and of- Yeah, and it is like most people do, do that now. You know, right. I think that's pretty standard, so. And so um, then what kind of other treatment did you have with that so first So then round? I had- um, chemo, radiation, and then about four and a half years of the, um, the anti-hormone drug tamoxifen, yep. which is given yep. to estrogen-driven tumors. Yes. And then I started having a lot of side effects. So they took me off of that. And I did really well. I mean, 1998, you know, I, and I really kind of put it aside that, um, you know, everything was fine, that it was never going to... Um, come back to haunt me. And then uh, my second breast cancer was six months after my mammogram in 2013. I mean, I had wow. a mammogram. I was doing everything I was supposed to be doing. And um, so then when I was diagnosed um, with breast cancer, you know, they said, you know, the BRCA gene, we want you tested for the genetic mutation because, you know, when you were diagnosed in 98, it was more in clinical trials. And they didn't offer that trial to me, you know, because they told me, what would you do with the information if you found you carried a genetic mutation? Mm -hmm. And in 98, I was like, I don't know, you tell me, you know. Right. Yes, exactly. <laughs> I have no idea. Right. Yeah, where now they understand, you know, more about uh, genetic mutation. So, um, yeah, so I did have the, it was taken really long to get results of the BRCA gene because that's when it was really becoming in the news, you know, around 2013. So um, there was, you know, Angelina Jolie and yes. all that, that 
Yes. You know, I think that's when it just brought a voice that people, you know, didn't quite understand what it was. Um, so the doctor said, you know, it's taken long for these tests to get back. Let's do just like your others. Let's do a lumpectomy. Start you, you know, you need chemo again. It's this aggressive tumor again. And that's what happened. They did that. And then during chemo, about a month into it, um, they said, yes, you do carry the BRCA gene. Wow. Now, do you, so, have daughter, yes. do you have daughters? I do have a daughter. And um, my daughter um, is negative. Good. She was tested. But um, there have been, this is really interesting. In my, I come from a very large family, you know, brothers and sisters. And um, let me see. I think there's been eight people tested and six are positive. Really? And nobody's ever had. So, so that was a really interesting, you know, but men, nobody was tested for many years except my daughter. My daughter was tested um, actually during when I was going through chemo. She was tested. Mm-hmm. And um, so, yeah, she was negative. And my son has not been tested. And um, other family members, I have a sister who's about 10 years, old, 10 years older than me. She is positive, and so is one of her daughters. And, you know, my sister has never had breast cancer. Um, I lost a sister to colon and um, lung cancer. Mm-hmm. And she had five children. One of her daughters has been tested, and she was negative. But I kind of have a feeling that maybe my daughter, my sister was positive. Yeah. And so, so so um, you said your son was not tested. Is it possible for a male to actually carry the BRCA gene? Yes. I have a brother who carries it, who was tested and, um, he has two daughters who are tested who are positive. Wow. Yeah. Wow. Genetics is an amazing thing. Yes. And Mm -hmm. so you wonder what that is then, right? So how is it that you, which I'm grateful for, but that you can carry the gene and it not actually show up as a cancer. I think that that would be just such an interesting conversation to find out why is that, which, you know, and again, I'm grateful for, but you want to know, all right, great. I want to carry the gene and I don't want it to show up. So what can I do to make it not show up? Right. Mm -hmm. Right. And I, yeah. And I think there's becoming, you know, I always tell them, you know, my story and, surgeries and things that I've chosen is because I know my mutation was Mm -hmm. very, you know, was there, but, you know, just because you carry it doesn't mean you have a defective mutation. Maybe with studies going on and everything else, I think um, it's just being um, aware and, you know, getting those mammograms, getting those MRIs and just, you know, seeing what happens now. Um, you know, with part of my plan was too to have my ovaries and fallopian tubes because I carried that, and I had right. a lot of trouble with insurance wanting to cover any of that. So I, I fought, you know, with them and um, kept getting denials. They said, "Well, we don't feel carrying the BRCA gene is a reason to have this surgery." Mm-hmm. So my, um, actually, the ovarian doctor who was going to remove it. She's a gynecological oncologist and she came forward and offered to do my surgery free of charge. Wow. Oh my she gosh. Said, <laughs> yes. And she said, under one thing, you keep getting this word out. She wow. Goes, because this is ridiculous that yes. our insurances are determining the treatment, how, the course of treatment you know, that you can have. Yeah. Yes. 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 That's, that's wow. crazy, you know? I agree. And I said, let me keep fighting. And she said, no, you know, and I did, you know, kind of hold off with that for a while. But then I got another denial. I got my story on um, ChicagoNow.com, who was looking, was doing a whole series on the BRCA gene. Um, my daughter has a blog with her um, testing through it. So, and we worked with our genetic counselor. He got some word out, you know, and got our story out. And then, uh, you know, I finally you know, did take the doctor up on the offer and she said, I will get everybody on board. In the morning of the surgery, she walks in and she was like, oh, I am so upset. And we're like, what's the matter? And she goes, 
I got everybody on board except the anesthesiologist. <gasps> We're like, please, doctor, you, you have done so much for us. We will, don't worry about that. We will cover it. Right. And in walks the anesthesiologist and he looked like he was about 20. And we're like, oh, the poor guy probably has so much medical uh, school bills. But um, yeah, it was, and it was really, really honored that she would do something like that. Right. And yeah, right after my surgery, my story appeared actually a week after my surgery and the insurance called my husband and said, we've decided to cover her uh, surgery. No <laughs> said, way. Well, yeah. So um, they said, but just keep it private, who the insurance is. And, you know, if your wife does any more stories and things that, you know, that's kept private because, you know, I think it's a case to case basis. Yeah. What, you know, I think it's getting better in the insurance covering um, elective surgeries for the um you know genetic mutations but yeah it's kind of scary that we have to go through all that well and you know that's here we are you're sick and you're fighting for your life as it is and then to have to take on another fight like that with the insurance company to keep yourself alive i think is ridiculous Uh, it's ridiculous however kudos to you for advocating for yourself Because how many people, you're you're an inspiration because many people will get that denial and they'll just say, okay, and they, and they won't ever have it done. And then who knows what happens, right? Whether they actually succumb to the disease or whether they're one of the lucky ones and they can, you know, stay in remission, but good for you for advocating and and just showing that you can fight that. (laughs) And you went on faith because you didn't even know that the insurance company was going to come back and say yes. Wow. Yeah, I know. And that, yeah, that was because so many people, we are denied so many things. I mean, right. They denied my being tested for the uh, BRCA gene. I had to pay that out of pocket. I never did get that covered, um, which now I think is better. I think things are getting better in that area of cancer care. But yeah, people don't realize that you can continue, you know, to put in appeals and things like that with the insurance. And that's, and you don't feel good. Who wants to start doing that's right. that? And that's why you need kind of an advocate. You need to put that whole group together of your doctors, family, friends, who all share, you know, in your healing and what it's going to take to heal you and not be afraid to ask people for help. That's right. And, um, yeah. You know, Michael, then my, I, my husband was sick for 20 years. And so we, too, dealt with insurance companies and fighting them. And I know that he would always use the power of the Indiana Department of Insurance. And so (laughs) when something would happen or they would fight a claim or whatever, then he would just throw that hat in the ring and he'd say, well, you know, that's fine. Can I have your name and your number? And I'm just going to contact the department, you know, Indiana Department of Insurance. (laughs) And all of a sudden it was interesting how many things we got done. So (laughs) how many, oh my gosh. Yes. So I I get it. Yeah. I'm sure your husband, I mean, to be his own advocate is really hard when you're not feeling good. And you know that, that, yeah, you know that firsthand. So when did you finish treatment with the second round of cancer then? So the second round, then I went through, um, you know, the lumpectomy and chemotherapy, and then I went on to have a double mastectomy and the ovary removal. Okay. And um, then and did the I insurance had... company cover the double mastectomy, or was that considered elective? Yes. 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 Okay. That was they covered. did. Okay. Good. Yeah, because I w- we were afraid of that too because they gave me a lumpectomy. Yes. You know, and now I'm having the elective because I carry the gene. Right. Um. So that yeah we were afraid of that, but they did, they did come through with that one. They, I didn't have to fight that. And, Good. Um, it was, yeah. I mean, that's something that you don't even think about um, when, you know, you all of a sudden get a cancer diagnosis and you think it's going to just go all smooth and one mm-hmm. there's not one size fits all. That's for yeah, that's sure. Right. That's right. And um, yeah. And, and then I was diagnosed in 2015 with, um, high Barrett's esophagus with high grade dysplasia, which was more of a precancer condition. Okay. I've always had like um, acid reflux, hiatal hernias. And when I got osteoporosis from the high dose chemo and my bones were more brittle, every time they would put me on a chemo medicine, um, a bone medicine, um, it would be 
the acid reflex would get worse. So they would take me off them and then they started putting me just on once a year infusions. And a doctor who was giving me a colonoscopy said, you know, can I give you an upper GI too? I've read your history. You carry the BRCA gene. Your father had throat cancer. And um, so after he gave me the colonoscopy and the upper GI, he's just shaking his head after. And he says, are you sure you're not in pain? He said, I've never seen so much inflammation in an esophagus. Wow. He said, I'm going to give you some medicine. I want you to clear it up because I can't, I don't even want to go in there and biopsy yet. He said, and after a couple months, we'll go back in there. And um, it still was, the inflammation was down, but I still had the barrett that was still at the high grade dysplasia. He said, I'm going to send you to one of the universities. They're doing a procedure called radioablation. It's only, mm -hmm. I think it's about 10, 15 years old. Mm -hmm. So they kind of ablate the esophagus of the Barrett's. And um, so the doctor down at Northwestern in Chicago said, it's probably going to take two to three treatments to get rid of your Barrett's. Well, once he got into my esophagus, he said, oh, you've got nodules too that we need to remove first. And it was during the, the procedures can only be every two months because you have to heal. Right. You know, your esophagus has to heal. So during the second um, treatment of removing the nodules, one of the nodules had turned to cancer, but it was superficial. You know, he removed it, he did radio ablation, and then just continued every two months on getting rid of the rest of the Barrett's. So My um, goodness. now, yeah, now I'm at once a year. So last August, it ended up taking till 2018. To get it, then, everything cleared up everything cleared up and now I'm on once a year like I'm due again in two weeks to go back down last August it was fine everything was looking good, good. it's staying it's staying stable with the medication but they would like me to fix my hiatal hernia but I kind of have put that aside yeah I would think right so now. too right with everything else you just kind of get tired of doctors after a while don't you <laughs> you know yeah. it's just I don't want to <laughs> see another doctor I, I might go, that's right if I go my whole life oh. so with that one so it's just a yearly you didn't have to go through any chemo or radiation or anything with no. the mm -mm. wonderful wonderful and do yeah, they so feel that's... like the three were related at all or was it just a luck of the draw kind well, of thing you know it's they know that my esophagus was caused by medications and things like that. And my hiatal hernia, you know, it's okay. where, kind of where my stomach and esophagus don't meet. Right. Yes. And um, then the, you know, the breast cancers, you know, they just, they were opposite breasts, but it was like exact. I mean, same size, same. It was just really strange. It was like, it just flipped over to the other side. Um, but yeah, so. They just said, you know, Karen, you just have a bad mutation. But I mean, it was 15 years in between. So I was lucky um, wow. to wow. do that, you know, to be able to get through. And so, um, yeah, well, you are an, you are an amazing inspiration to continue to to fight. And, you know, I'm so grateful that that we will have the opportunity to share your story, because I know that, you know, unfortunately, women are diagnosed every day. And it's what, why you inspire me is because of the fact that you are here to till, still tell your story, that you fought it not once, oh, but three you. times, and that you're still here. And um, actually, we're almost out of time. So I'm hoping, I would love to, for you to come back and be another guest again, because we didn't even get to get into the know, oncology, the skincare. Where I work. No. Why I became an esthetician. That was I the know. next question. See? So I, I know would we love... needed to shorten that. <laughs> yeah, no, no. But... This, I wanted all of this. So, so I'm going to say thank you for joining me today. And I would appreciate if you would be, come back and be my guest again. Um, so sure, if, I would love that. Great. Awesome. And well, um, I do if, like to tell that portion of it because, you know, sometimes I tend to gloss over it, but I think it's important to kind of get that out there and everybody, you know, you're not alone for those who are fighting this that, and, um, you can go on to live a normal life and that's right. That's right. Grow from it. But yeah, right. we, we'll get into why I became an esthetician. That was... 
<laughs> that would be great. I would love to have you back. So if you have any questions or comments about the guests on our show or would like more information about Hello Gorgeous, feel free to contact me at kbecker at hellogorgeous.org or visit our website at www.hellogorgeous.org. Thank you so much for joining me today on Hello Gorgeous, everything beauty, cancer, and inspiration. I'm your host, Kim Becker. And until next time, stay gorgeous. Another beautiful day Walking in the sunshine Spending the time with you Last night we had a good time Dancing in the moonlight And loving the night away I can't imagine what it'd be like I can't imagine what it'd be like I can't imagine what it'd be like without you I can't imagine that